This talk is going to be focused on low-tech design, specifically designing how we design complexes. As a reminder, all of this information is available in the manual. This, what we're going about to cover here, is going to be found in Chapter 5 predominantly, and paradoxically the next talk, which is going to focus on structure design, is going to, can be found in Chapter 4 of the low-tech manual. The outline for what we're going to discuss over the next 40 minutes or so uh, all focuses on, again, this design of low-tech structure complexes. So we're going to cover a little bit of the backdrop, a little context that provides us some of the context for a design, which will help us decide and sort of discuss what does a design need to accomplish? What does it need to do? Following that, what are the key elements of a restoration design? What are the actual things you should be including when you pass the design off to whoever it is you'll be passing it off to. And most interestingly, and probably what most folks are here for, is how do you actually decide what you're going to do? How do you formulate a restoration design? A reminder that the design process takes place within this larger conservation planning process backdrop. And so everything we're going to cover here is based on the assumption that you've gone through the earlier phases, phase one, where you've done your planning where you've assessed the geomorphic and riparian conditions and address the recovery potential. And so those resources are also available if you haven't, if you missed out on those. In this, we're going to talk a little bit about, more about the sort of nuts and bolts of, you know, will this approach work? How do you know? What are some of the things you're thinking about in terms of the condition and recovery potential? And how do you link those to making decisions on the ground? As a general background, you know, when we talk about restoration design, what do we think of? Well, we might think of some of the things shown here. Base topography, base topographic maps that show us the sort of general lay of the land where we're working. We might expect to see specific cross-sections, by which I mean not a cross-section that's representative or typical, but something that truly reflects a, you know, a cross-section that's out there on the ground. It's important to note that both of these products require extensive pre-project field work to capture. Field surveys are not cheap, um, they're not very inexpensive, and in order to cover large amounts of ground as we're advocating, as we're talking about the scope of degradation, this might become cost prohibitive. We'd also like to suggest that by embracing the planning process that we went through in earlier phases, we don't need the same level of detail that you might expect from a more heavily engineered restoration project that happens to take place in a more either urban setting or with more infrastructure concerns. This isn't to say that high resolution topography isn't very both exciting to use and can be very useful, but when we are discussing what is truly necessary for embracing these approaches, in a lot of the areas in which we find ourselves working, that's simply more than we need to do. Something that's common to both you know, a more engineering-based approach to restoration and a low-tech restoration is the use of sort of typical structure schematics, by which I mean those illustrations that you can provide to either contractors or regulators that illustrate what it is you're hoping to build. I also want to be clear that collecting pre-project data, especially topographic data, can also be used to answer a whole host of really exciting scientific questions uh, and we're not touching on that here. We're simply saying that in order to pursue low-tech responsibly, you don't need high-resolution topography or hydraulic models that run on that topography. Instead, we're advocating that this process is heavily field-based. It relies on site-specific conditions, both geomorphic and riparian. It can be done quickly, and it can be documented using either apps on mobile devices or simply pen and paper and collecting GPS points. Most importantly, it generates testable hypotheses. It's transparent. It specifically articulates what we're hoping to do by building the sorts of structures that we're designing. And as such, it doesn't require the high resolution topography or hydraulic models that might be common along either larger streams or areas that have more impressive infrastructure. But before we dive in, we need to get a few terms crossed off our list. The first thing we're going to talk about are complexes. So when I say complex, all I mean is a group of structures. It could be composed of both beaver dam analogs or post-assisted log structures, BDAs and PALs, that work together to mimic and promote specific processes and achieve 
particular or specific objectives. The second thing uh, we're going to cover here and talk a lot about is the zone of influence, by which we mean the area that a complex is capable of influencing either hydraulically or geomorphically. And both of these are, we're going to see how both of these influence both our sort of checks on our planning process to make sure we aren't putting anything at risk, as well as help set the stage for realistic expectations and or how many restoration treatments are really going to be necessary to achieve our long-term objectives. To illustrate that, here we're showing a complex. It happens to be composed of four beaver dam analogs. Those are outlined with the, the crest elevation in red, so showing how it's spanning the channel. In yellow, the dashed yellow line I've represented the valley bottom. And in this case, uh, for this particular reach along this particular stream, the recovery potential, something we covered earlier in the planning phase, is that 100% of this valley bottom could be activated. So that means either you know, anastomosing conditions or at a minimum at least having channel floodplain connectivity on a you know, more or less annual basis. The zone of influence, however, at, at present, doesn't, hasn't realized that full potential just yet. And this is after just one treatment. And so what's outlined in blue is the area that these structures are currently capable of implementing, or I'm sorry, uh, influencing rather, during a typical flood event. It's not to say that during a high flow event this whole valley bottom might not be activated. It very well may be. But during typical conditions, the conditions most responsible for creating and maintaining habitat, at present, the zone of influence isn't expanding to cover the full valley bottom. It's important when we talk about restoration and restoration design to sort of think of the sort of different spatial scales at which we make decisions, at which we set goals, at which we set objectives. What I want to focus on in this talk, though, is this sort of intermediate scale, the scale, again, of a complex, a cluster of structures. And it, because it's at this scale that we, you know, make some of the more important design decisions. If we look at this x-axis on this figure, we can see that Oftentimes, big goals, big project goals, broad management goals are often discussed or addressed over tens of kilometers. Um, those are increasing system resilience or species abundance, all of these sort of broad, you know, big picture goals. Uh, conversely, if we zoom down to the structure levels, the sort of minimum unit that we might think of, at those scales, we are still thinking about specific responses but the restoration goals we have aren't going to be achieved at the scale of an individual structure. For example, no one is going to build uh, a single BDA and, and expect a, you know, a fish population response. And so one of the objectives of focusing at this intermediate scale is that it keeps us away, keeps us out of the sort of minutia of individual structures and forces us to focus on a spatial scale that is both tractable, tractable one that we make decisions at, and one that is going to be more important for achieving our restoration objectives. And so the examples on here, ones that we'll continually revisit throughout, include increasing lateral and vertical connectivity, recovery from incision, increasing habitat complexity, or increasing beaver dam activity. So what does a design need to do? Well, most fundamentally, it needs to communicate. Um, and we'll talk about with whom in just a moment. But it needs to communicate the extent, the spatial extent over which you're working, the methods you're hoping to use, and some of the expected or hypothesized responses to restoration. The level of detail, the specific level of detail you include in the design is going to depend. And it's going to depend on who you're communicating with. So who is going to be using a design? Well, it could be regulators, folks who are looking at permit applications. It could be agencies that are seeking proposals for restoration who are attempting to make cost estimates. Um, and it can also be independent contractors who may be actually responsible for implementing a design. The degree of detail that you put in there, there is going to be slightly different depending on which one of these areas you're hoping to address, which person you're actually communicating with. So what are the things you're going to put into that design to facilitate that communication? And what we're proposing here is just the recommended minimum design, what we think 
is not too onerous and that everybody could include when creating these designs. And so we're going to go through each of these individually. But they include project, project scale maps, complex scale maps, design tables, and typical structure schematics. What are those things? Well, project map is just kind of as it says. It shows lo complex locations along a drainage network. They can be represented as lines or polygons. And we'll, we'll show some examples of this in a moment. It includes complex maps, where we zoom in a little bit to show the specific structure types and either specific or approximate locations of structures within a complex, and it identifies both the zone of influence and the valley bottom where that complex is located. It includes a table where we can articulate much of the same information and provide the sort of both objective of a structure and, you know, a short narrative of how the structures we're building are going to achieve that objective. And finally, it includes schematics, the kinds of illustrations that are often required in stream bed alteration permits or, you know, when responding to requests for proposals in order to communicate what actually are you going to be putting in the creek? What is it you're actually going to be building? And that's really important because when the same term has been used to represent a variety of structures, showing specific or typical in this case structure illustrations really helps folks on the other side of the equation whether it be funders or regulators get a feel for what you're going to do so first we'll talk about project scale maps project scale map can be something as simple as this this represents a couple of miles of creek um, happens to be in northwestern utah and what's been identified along the creek are the different locations of complexes and the objectives of those complexes in order to provide a bit more context, inset photogra photographs have been supplied uh, to sort of represent some of the variable conditions there. And we'll talk a little bit more about the link between conditions, recovery potential, and design later in the talk. But this simply says, where are you working? And what are some of the things you're hoping to achieve? If we zoom in one step from that to the individual complex, we, can, we might see a map that looks like this. And so we've zoomed into that same uh, reach that was illustrated in the first map. It happens to be an incised reach, something you can see from the inset photo. And what's been identified is the valley bottom. So again, the maximum extent that could ever be influenced by restoration. The zone of influence outlined in green. In other words, what we expect this first treatment to be able to influence. And in this case, the specific structure types and locations have actually been specifically identified on the map. Um, in the sort of narrative that's in the upper right hand corner, there's a little more variability. It provides a range, five plus or minus two, 10 plus or minus two structures. But generally it gives an idea for what are we hoping to accomplish here? And we'll, we'll link back to, or we'll cover in a few slides, we'll cover what some specific objectives are and what that narrative means. But for now, I just want to illustrate, this is what a complex map might look like. Another way we can communicate this is through design tables, where rather than having a row for every individual structure, we have a row for every complex. And that might say what the objective is. So here we show three different objectives, incision recovery, beaver translocation, and an increase in lateral connectivity. The rough complex length is given, the range of structures that will be built is given, and the range of structure types is also given. And if we scan to the far right column, what we see is this brief description. So we might see something in the case of beaver translocation, for example, and it says, use primary BDAs to create deep water habitat for translocation and secondary BDAs to support primary dams by reducing head drop and increasing the extent and ponded area for forage access and refuge from predation. And so that gives anyone who's looking a really clear idea of what the goal that we're trying to accomplish here and why BDAs are the appropriate tool for it. Lastly, the schematics. And this is something that we're, I'm putting in here to A, illustrate what they look like, why you might want to provide them, and also to say that these can be used by anyone here. These are available for everybody. They all have a Creative Commons license. You can see in the bottom left-hand corner. And these are for you to use when you're applying for permits. If you're applying for permits that where you're hoping to build PALs or BDAs, please, please use these. These are available online and they're for everyone to use. Uh, we've got a whole bunch of different illustrations there for BDAs, PALs. There's also, there are also some from 
the sort of post lion wicker weave, the earlier iteration of BDAs, or one of the iterations of BDAs, and these are all there. And so they provide both a cross section view, a plan form view, bird's eye view, or a profile view to give whoever's looking a really good idea of what you're actually trying to do. Uh, if you get these online, you'll also be able to read the text a little more easily. Uh, and so they provide a sort of brief description in addition to the illustration that can help increase the understanding and help you communicate with whoever is either building or permitting or you know estimating costs for the structures you're hoping to design. A quick plug here uh, that these are exactly the sort of spec sheets that can be used in the NC NRCS Conservation Practice 643. So if you're looking for design drawings, these are those drawings that you can use. And now the most sort of important or, or perhaps interesting part is what cues are you actually using on the landscape to make these decisions? When do you want to build BDAs? When do you want to build complexes that only use BDAs? When do you want to build complexes that rely more heavily on post-assisted log structures? How do you actually make these calls in the field? And what's important to note is that you will have done, by the time you get here to this design component, you'll have done most of the heavy lifting that helps you make those decisions. Because what really drives your design is the existing condition and the potential condition. Those are the things that are going to inform what you do. And so in the bottom right of this slide, you see a sort of a, a figure that illustrates project goals, nested, you know, or complex objectives nested within project goals. And somewhere below that, we have our actual, you know, structure designs. And what's important is that these things are all related to one another. And we'll provide some specific examples immediately coming up here about what I mean by that. But just remember that the design itself is driven by a lot of the evidence and assessment that has come out of the planning process. And so some common complex objectives might include increasing in-stream complexity, incision recovery, beaver translocation, and increasing channel floodplain connectivity. But rather than just say that, we want to pull apart what are the existing conditions that likely lead to those objectives. Well, in the case of increasing in-stream complexity, you likely have low topographic complexity, a stream dominated by planar features or maybe single thread instead of multi-threaded channels, lacks of a lack of pool and riffles, wood, beaver dams, etc. If you state that you need to recover from incision, it must mean you're working with an incised channel characterized by disconnection from the floodplain and steep banks. May also include, you know, very simple in-stream habitat as well. If your goal is beaver translocation, we can assume that in the planning process, you found that there was sufficient forage and you know, riparian wood, woody vegetation for beaver dam building and for forage. And it may or may not be a you know, low to moderate complexity stream. Finally, if your goal is increasing channel floodplain connectivity, we can assume that you have an accessible floodplain, but it's not currently being accessed due to a lack of structural forcing, a lack of wood, a lack of beaver dams. It's important to note that when we list these objectives, we are, for the moment, making it specific to this first phase of restoration. We're not necessarily talking about a long-term objective, and that's something we're going to cover towards the end of this talk, um, is that low-tech restoration in general is really geared towards a more sort of management-oriented approach where we are building on the first treatment to move to a second, to move to a third. More likely than not, we're trying to get away from this one and done approach to restoration. And so we may have a long-term goal of increasing channel floodplain connectivity, but in the short term, we might need to recover from incision first. A quick refresher uh, on what the structure types that we are going to be talking about are and how we're going to use them within a complex. Uh, PALs are built to mimic wood accumulation. They can be built channel spanning, attached to a bank, mid-channel. They do not or are not designed to form ponds immediately upon construction, and we often use them to alter hydraulics and force geomorphic responses. By contrast, beaver dam analogs, while still hand-built, still using wood, are designed to immediately create the, a pond upstream of the dam, and therefore they are always channel spanning. Reminder via illustration 
PALs, again, can be built in a number more different configurations, whereas BDAs are always channel spanning and always designed to form a pond upstream. And so the first sort of complex design we're going to cover is for incision recovery. So it's the same photo we've been looking at previously, and also the same sort of simplified stream evolution model that we've seen previously. And so the existing condition here is incised. Uh, so you can see that from the photograph, steep banks, it's pretty narrow, there's uh, upland species, namely sagebrush, on the floodplain where it doesn't quite belong. Uh, so we know that that's not getting a lot of water. We also know, based on our planning, that the valley bottom within which this stream is flowing could eventually be 100% activated, meaning there are no infrastructure constraints there, there's nothing limiting this stream from accessing its whole valley bottom and being in anastomosing conditions. However, in this first phase, we're not trying to get to that. That's not a realistic first phase goal here, first phase objective. Instead, what we're hoping to do is widen and degrade the channel. And so I've outlined those two stages in the stream evolution model on the bottom right. Whether or not it's predominantly a widening or a, an aggrading and widening that takes place is not critical to us. Either way, we're moving towards the condition we want. And so what's our strategy for a system or a setting like this? It's to force that channel widening and aggradation. And how? Well, by using, in this case, bank-attached and channel-spanning PALs. And if we pull apart why um, the goal, why we might use PALs instead of BDAs, simply put, it's because if our goal is to widen, that means end cut, widen the channel, then the ponds forced by BDAs will necessarily drain, and they won't be achieving anything that a bank-attached or channel-spanning PALs can do and we can build those structures with less resources than BDAs. If we look at what the complex map of something that uh, for this might be, it's the same map we looked at earlier. It provide, we're providing the types and counts, or in this case, a range of structures. So we're saying three to seven channel spanning PALs and eight to 12 bank attached over about 200 meters. We've also identified the zone of influence. And what you can tell is that it doesn't take up very much of the valley bottom. And in fact, it's probably uh, pretty, it's actually quite exaggerated from what we really would expect because we're not expecting to be able to force flows over bank in this situation. The zone of influence here is really just limited to as much widening as the channel can do given one restoration treatment. And as a general rule of thumb, we wouldn't expect the widening to be any greater than the current channel width. So in this figure, We've identified, again, the valley bottom, zone of influence, the types of structures, and here we've identified the specific locations. We're not advocating that that's always necessary, but this is something you would want to do if you were passing a design off to for a, you know, a crew that was going to implement these, and they needed to know where specifically you wanted them. A contrasting example we can provide, uh, which in, in truth is along the same stream, just downstream, is if we're designing a complex for beaver translocation. It's important to always keep our mind on the reality that the best thing we can do in a lot of systems, and by no means all systems, is get the critters in there that will do most of the work for us because they work harder and they're always there maintaining things. Beaver dam analogs, as we've talked about previously, are unlikely to maintain ponds unless they themselves are maintained, whether by us or more hopefully by our, by our little furry friends. And so in this case, what should jump out immediately is that I'm not showing you a zoomed in picture of the channel because in this case, it's actually a little bit less important. When, what I wanna communicate here is that this reach is characterized by abundant riparian vegetation, which makes it an appropriate place to translocate beaver. Its existing condition is, you know, slightly incised with ex extensive riparian vegetation. The potential here is the same as upstream. It's that we could be occupying the entire valley bottom, having anastomosing conditions. But here, as opposed to widening or increasing lateral connectivity, we are very clearly only trying to create deep water habitat for beaver translocation. Because if we can get beaver established, they will do far better work than we're capable of. Our strategy then, if which follows from all of this, is that we're going to rely exclusively on BDAs to create extensive ponds. Because the more ponds we can create, the more sort of safe access to forage beaver will have. 
So when we map this out, it looks very different than the complex that we showed for incision recovery. We see only one structure type, BDAs, because every we want everything to be pond forming. We want to create as much pond habitat as possible. And the other stark difference is here, the zone of influence is actually the same as the valley bottom in that area. Of course, we don't know if that will exactly be what happens, what transpires, because we're relying in this case on the road in itself, but we are planning or designing with that in mind, that that is a very real possibility here. Because if beaver do take off and do stick and build their own dams and extend, you know, the sort of channel network, the uh, forcing flows over bank or canal building, we could easily occupy this whole area. In practice, because this is a, a, a real life example from Northwestern Utah, what we saw after just one year is not that the zone of influence didn't quite reach, the sort of realized zone of influence didn't quite reach the entire valley bottom, but it occupied a whole bit of it uh, in places about 60 meters wide. And since in fact this photo was taken, that footprint has continued to expand both upstream and laterally as well. Another important thing to keep in mind as we're designing is that the zones of influence of different complexes can overlap. It's not that they only are like puzzle pieces which only fit together and don't overlap, but in some cases, the complexes you might build in one area actually enable new opportunities on a floodplain or on side channels, which then themselves can be the sites of additional complexes. And so don't get lost in the, in the pretty colors here. The, the take home message, and we'll zoom into a specific example here in a moment, but the take home message is that it's okay for zones of influence to overlap, especially as new surfaces are activated by different complexes. And so first we're going to focus on a complex that was designed to increase lateral connectivity. And that complex is shown in the sort of center bottom of the picture in the blue lines, which are post assisted log structures. And so what you can tell here is that the goal of this complex is to force flows onto this right, this accessible surface river right. There's a side channel there that's high and dry, as well as a lot of, you know, floodplain that could be activated. So therefore, the zone of influence extends really far downstream because of the hypothesized response, pushing water up over onto that surface, and eventually a couple you know, hundred meters yard down, a couple hundred meters downstream, it will come back into the channel. What you'll also note, though, is that within that large zone of influence, there are a whole bunch of other structures. Here they're outlined in black. And those aren't being considered as part of the complex because remember, a complex has a pretty specific objective. Here, the objective is increasing lateral connectivity. Whereas, the structures that are within this complex, or within this zone of influence, shown here uh, as the sort of orange, pink, and red lines, those structures are actually different. Those are all BDAs designed to increase ponding, create deep water habitat, pond and wetlands creation. So it's actually the upstream PALs activating a new surface and a new channel that creates the opportunity to build another complex. And so this is where we're seeing that it's okay that the zones of influence of different complexes overlap. Because without those structures on the main stem, the opportunity for structures on these side channels wouldn't be present. So we do see overlap here. This figure is trying to illustrate the sorts of structures and the proportions of different types of structures you would use for varying complex objectives. It's not meant to be a hard and fast rule. It's not based on specific data. So we'll walk through it together. From the first complex objective on the left, beaver translocation, something we just talked about, what it's saying is that if your complex objective is beaver translocation, you are going to be relying primarily on beaver dam analogs, primary and secondary BDAs. The difference simply being that primary BDAs tend to be the larger BDAs, whereas secondary BDAs are more designed to extend pond habitat and support primary BDAs. But overall, your complex is going to be composed of structures that force upstream ponding when your goal is translocation. 
because you can imagine that a post-assisted log structure that doesn't form a pond or is attached to a bank doesn't do a whole lot of good for a translocated beaver necessarily. By contrast, if your goal is incision recovery, you're going to be more likely to use PALs. Uh, in this case, or as illustrated here, more specifically, bank-attached PALs and channel spanning, channel spanning PALs, because those are the structures that are most likely to help you force widening. Um, we're not going to cover sort of the necessarily the logistic differences and time commitments and resources necessary to build BDAs or PALs, um, although that is certainly part of the equation in making that decision. Um, more importantly, though, we want to focus on if you're recovering from incision, BDAs are not really what you're going for because the incision recovery process will require the erosion around that structure, which will mean it won't be forming a pond, and you could have just cut to the chase and built some PALs instead of spending the time building what was a very, very temporary uh, BDA or pond formed by BDA. Moving across, if we look at floodplain connectivity, you use a variety of structures, but more of them are focused on being channel spanning because, again, the goal is to force flows up and out of the floodplain or onto the floodplain by creating obstructions in the channel, increasing roughness that will be capable of dispersing those flows. In that case, structures like bank attached PALs or mid channel PALs, which are less likely to be able to do that, aren't going to be as effective, so we don't use them as much. The reason that uh, there's always a few structures that might meet those different, um, that might not be channel spanning in this case, is because it's important to note that on any project, there's always sort of a background level of increasing complexity that can be beneficial. And so we're not saying, we're rarely, if ever, would say, don't use any of a particular structure type. Finally, if your goal is increasing in-stream complexity, it follows that it would make sense to use the widest variety or the most equal distribution of structure types because each of them has a, will have a different hydraulic and geomorphic influence. And so by varying the structure types, you're varying the sort of structure responses in maximizing your complexity. It's also important to not lose sight of how important flow conditions are to getting a restoration response. Generally speaking, if you implement a restoration project and flow conditions are drought-like for the next five or ten years, what you can expect to see is going to be very different than if you have high flow conditions. And so this figure, uh, if we walk through it briefly, simply illustrates that, that notion. It says that after you've implemented restoration, after you've put structures in, if you are followed up by low flows or base flow conditions, what you can expect hydraulically or geomorphically, hydro hydrologically, is going to be limited. If you get sort of annual high flow conditions, or, you know, your typical floods each year, you would expect a corresponding increase in the range of response that you might get. Greater flow compel complexity, greater deposition and grain sorting, more, a little bit more topographic diversity, because some of those geomorphic processes can't be activated at base flow or low flow, and they do require higher flows. At the other end of the spectrum, high flows, we'd expect a wide range of responses. In general, we'd probably expect to see the greatest response, but it's also important to note that really high flows can blow out structures, rendering them you know, ineffective or gone. And that's not to say that it wasn't worth doing. All restoration, whether heavily engineered or low-tech, is still at some level going to be subservient to the flow conditions that you get. This is really designed to help us develop realistic expectations following restoration. The final thing we'd like to address is this notion of how long is it going to take? How many treatments do I need to do before we achieve our goals? <coughs> and so we're going to use that same stream evolution model we've used before to illustrate this. If we suppose that we are in an, you know, incised state, and therefore our first goal, our first appropriate goal is a grading and widening, we might say our phase one objective is simply to widen and grade, or here shown in the, in the red oval. However, we know that our, based on our planning, if our end condition, if our recovery potential is our anastomosing or stage zero conditions across the valley bottom, 
That's still where we'd ultimately like to get to, but we recognize that we can't get there in just one treatment because the first treatment really needs to focus on the widening and aggregation. And so our goal as practitioners, as designers, managers, and funders is to articulate those different phases that are going to be necessary. That's important for setting the stage for you know, continued involvement before, as processes you know, recover and hopefully eventually become self-sustaining. It's important for expectation management when dealing with landowners, funders, with everybody really. And so while we're not going to dive into the same level of detail for subsequent phases of restoration, um, we do want to put it out there in sort of at least a sort of qualitative descriptive fashion about what's possible, what we might be able to expect. One way of doing that is through illustrations. And so here is a site located in Central Oregon where uh, actually a professional artist has rendered the sort of expectations for the short term, medium term, and long term <coughs> to restoration. And what we see is in the short term, we are mimicking the processes. We're just getting a lot of structure into that stream because currently it's lacking. Hopefully this will also promote some natural beaver dam activity. In the medium term, so we could think of that as after a number of typical floods, maybe one or two higher flow events, the processes of beaver dam activity and wood accumulation are naturally initiated and start to sustain themselves. And finally, if we continue, hopefully these processes become self-sustaining, at which point our goal or you know our job here is done. If that system is maintaining both beaver dam activity and wood accumulations on its own, then it doesn't need the structural interventions that we would do through direct restoration. Another way to illustrate this is as a mapping exercise where we can show the active channel, the active floodplain, and the inactive floodplain, something we've done during the planning process. And we can communicate this for those different phases where maybe our design in the first phase is for 132 in this case, plus or minus 15 structures. And here they're illustrated simply as dots. They could have just as easily been shown as the complex as we looked at earlier. And what our goal here is to see the proportion of that valley shift and see the proportion of the active floodplain increase at the expense of the inactive floodplain. So in a secondary phase, we hope to see more active channel as side channels are activated. And we also see more flows being pushed over bank, activating the floodplain. You'll also note that the number of structures in phase two is considerably less than the first, because what we expect is to, after that initial phase, to have to do a little bit less work during subsequent phases. To the point where we get to a third phase, and we're down to only 25 sort of maintenance structures. And those are the kinds of things where we might be taking advantage of newly activated surfaces, of newly created channels. This exercise also provides some of some ideas, some sort of indicator metrics we could use when talking about what to expect in the future. So as we see changes in the proportion of the valley bottom occupied by the channel, the active floodplain, and the inactive floodplain, those are the sorts of attributes or the areas that we could map and use to evaluate restoration. And that's what's shown in the bottom here, in those bar charts. Increasing proportions of active channel, increasing proportions of active floodplain, and a decreasing inactive floodplain. We can also communicate those same ideas tabularly or in a, in a chart here. And so I don't want you to get sucked in too hard to this except to focus on that this is taking a stab, this is sort of hypothesizing what a longer term outlook might be. So we have the existing conditions, the as-built, which won't deviate very much at all from the existing, except for the increased number of structures, a two-year hypothesized response, which could again be more accurately put as a number of flow conditions later, and then finally some long-term goal that illustrates that this is really where we're trying to get to. And so some of the metrics, some of the indicators we can use are the proportions of the valley bottom. If we are, you, we could use the stages proposed uh, that we've talked about in the stream evolution model. And we can also do more simple, use more simple indicators, like simply counting the density of wood accumulations, natural beaver dams, and man-made restoration structures.
In summary, low tech design is really focused on the complex scale, this sort of intermediate scale that f forces us to keep our goal, you know, our eyes on the restoration goals that really matter without getting sucked into the minutia of every individual structure. Um, that we will talk about structure design in the next talk. It's a rapid field-based protocol and it can, generates testable, transparent hypotheses. And it helps us articulate the why, you know, in addition to the what we're doing. It identifies both the valley bottom and zone of influence to help develop realistic expectations. And it's driven by the condition and recovery potential that we establish during the planning phases. Lastly, it's a communication tool. It can be used by regulators, contractors, management agencies, and funding groups. The specific details of, that are required in your specific design will depend on the folks you're communicating with and the specific goals of your design, whether it's meant as a document to be used by someone to implement exactly as it is, or a communication tool for other purposes.